everyone. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Maddie Dunn, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at great programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please email us at dolesab at ku.edu or speak with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel, and you can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have any questions about the loop system, or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able to and ask just one brief question. If you're part of our virtual audience, you may submit your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now please join me in welcoming our Director of Programs and Student Affairs, Sarah Stacy. Hello everybody, thank you for coming tonight and thank you Maddie for that great welcome. I'm a little bit short here. <laughs> so, thank you for joining us for tonight's program Taylor Swift, A Conversation on Influence and Advocacy. So this program was conceived, planned, and presented by our Student Advisory Board, and it's in partnership with the KU Swift Society. So I'm really delighted to see so many people in the crowd, especially students. I highly encourage you all to get involved with the SAB. As some of you know all too well, the SAB is a pathway to many opportunities, including internship assistance, interacting with experts in the fields of politics and journalism, and making friends on both sides of the aisle. So, we have other student-driven programs, including Pizza and Politics. Our next one will be November 3rd in the business school at noon. So, you can come for a, a different type of conversation on the state of the economy. So, more free pizza for you students. <laughs> Additionally, our next SAB meeting will be here at the Institute. Um, so it's always the first Tuesday of the month, so Tuesday, November 7th at 5.30 p.m. So if you're interested in learning more, talk to me, one of our student workers or anyone, and email us at dolesab at ku.edu. And before we start with the program, I wanna like give a shout out to two students. So our SAB coordinator, Ali Hager, and also, um, where is Samantha Steven? And also, our marketing intern, Samantha Steven. I can't tell you how much of their heart and soul they put into this program. I'm so proud of them. Great job, girls. <laughs> All right, now, if you're ready for it, join me in welcoming the president of the KU Swift Society, Alexis Greenberg. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. The KU Swift Society is a group of Swifties cultivating an inclusive, fun, and social community where KU students can make new friends and celebrate the artistry and lyricism of Taylor Swift. You can follow us on Instagram at KU Swift Society and find out more information about our upcoming events, opportunities, and activities. Now, to introduce our guest speakers for tonight. Brian Donovan is a professor of sociology here at the University of Kansas. His research focuses on gender, popular culture, and American society. He has published three books and his work has appeared in several academic journals. His most recent book, American Gold Digger, examines the cultural impact of the gold digger stereotype in American culture. He's currently interviewing hundreds of Swifties for a book about the Taylor Swift fandom. Dr. Hannah Wing is an assistant professor at the Elliott School of Communications at Wichita State University. Her research is centered on examining the relationships between media consumers and media personae, including how fans are influenced by the behavior of celebrities. She is also currently researching Taylor Swift fans and the experiences that they had while trying to obtain tickets to the Eras Tour. 
Now I'll hand it over to the Student Advisory Board Coordinator, Ali, and our panelists. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you, so, thank you so much to both of you for joining us tonight. So just to begin, can you tell me a little bit about your background, how you got into your field, the position that you are in now, and what made you interested in studying Taylor Swift and what exactly you study about her? Yeah, I can go ahead and start. So um, my background, I'm in the School of Communication, so I studied actually advertising as an undergrad um, and then realized I cared a lot more about um, analyzing media messages than creating them. So I went to graduate school, got my PhD at Ohio State University in communications in media effects, and there I became really passionate about parasocial relationships, the relationships that people have with celebrities. And so um, that's what I'm looking at right now. And so I've been doing work looking at relationships with celebrities. Meanwhile, I'm, I dedicated my dissertation to Taylor Swift, and I'm trying to get tickets to the Eras tour. And I'm realizing, wow, there's a lot here that I could just be doing my favorite thing and researching Taylor Swift, um, but doing this within the realm of my job. And so um, that's why I started doing this, this first project on Taylor Swift. So I'm, I know a lot about relationships with celebrities, and now I'm really digging into the, the biggest one uh, that I have, and that is Taylor Swift. Yeah, so uh, I've been at the University of Kansas since 2001. I'm in the sociology department, and I focus primarily on historical sociology and cultural sociology. And something that I noticed about five years ago, my students in my cultural sociology class would bring up Taylor Swift. Regardless of the topic, they would find some way to connect Taylor <laughs> to the topic. And I, I thought to myself, I think I could teach a whole class about Taylor Swift. And it was about at that time that I started Fall, you know, falling down the rabbit hole and becoming uh, a kind of rabid Swifty myself. And so I've decided to uh, focus my teaching and currently my research on Taylor Swift, but more specifically her fans. Mm -hmm. So more than, or a very large percentage of US adults say that they're Taylor Swift fans. Can you guys talk just a little bit about how big the fandom is and how big of a reach she has? I, I mean, I think with all due respect to other fandoms, in particular the Bayhive and the BTS Army, I think it's safe to say that the Swifties are the largest and most energetic fandom in the United States. And uh, the demographic research on Swift fans is limited at this time, but what we know is that it is primarily, uh, primarily female, primarily millennial, uh, and prim primarily white, but I do think that it's much more diverse than a lot of people realize. Yeah, I think one thing that's really remarkable about, the, about Taylor Swift fans right now is the cross-generational impact that she has. When, you know, when you're at the Ares tour, you see so many moms with their daughters and um, you know, even grandparents there as well, and you see plenty of dads, right, with the, it's me, I'm the dad, it's me shirt on, right? It's just crossing so many different um, different spectrums of, of fans that can all relate to her music in some way, despite her just being, you know, a young woman. So when Swift first spoke out about politics in 2018 and urged fans to vote, we saw a record surge in voter registration. What did this decision mean for both politics and her career? I think this is one of the first times um, we've really seen um, Taylor use her her power to encourage participation in, in, in politics. Um, not the first time she's been um, becoming more and more involved, but this is um, one of the first calls to action we've really seen from her. Um, we've seen kind of her, her morals or, or her, her own principles that people can assume, but this is one of the first times she has directly spoken to her fans and encouraged them to take a specific action. And so I think that that's a really exciting um, thing that she's done and to see the impact that it has and to see that the impact she could potentially have in the future as well. Yeah, I, I think her, her political turn in 2018 was uh, monumentous and it really signaled that she was using her voice in a, a new way. I've heard criticism about her political silence before 2018, particularly her political silence uh, during the 2016 election. And I hear those concerns, I understand them. I think though, if we put it in context, we should recognize that she came from a country music background that tilted more conservative. She saw what happened to the Dixie Chicks, now called the Chicks, 
uh, and when they spoke out about politics. And during the 2016 election, she was facing a barrage of attacks uh, on social media from the entertainment press. And I, I think that provides crucial context about why she waited until 2018 to make a bold political statement. Mm -hmm. So you talked about this criticism that she faced sometimes when she didn't speak out. Um, so to what extent do you think that fans, maybe not only Taylor Swift fans, but other fans, expect celebrities to use their platforms to talk about important issues like this? As I've been interviewing fans for a different project about their expectations for celebrities, um, I've noticed an increasing trend of them expecting celebrities to um, make statements politically, whether that is through their art um, or on stage or um, in other aspects. It's something they're increasingly caring about. Um, for instance, uh, Harry Styles fans, he holds up different flags um, supporting different um, cr groups and different causes. And when he misses a flag or when he doesn't, you know, it seems like he doesn't hold up a flag, they become very up actively upset. And so it's kind of an expectation now um, that um, they speak out in some way that's kind of, you know, that silence is violence in a way that it's no longer acceptable to, to not rock the boat by not saying anything. There's some, some sort of expectation there that celebrities should say something. And I, I don't know if it's part of a, a larger trend of more and more things have a political valence in that, you know, Target uh, has a, a politics to it or Bud Light has a politics to it. But I, I feel like fans now have some expectation of their, uh, the, the object of their fandom speaking out politically. I think it's, it's delicate, though, because when we have expectations that celebrities uh, take political stances, it might not work out the way that we think it might in that we're, we're asking somebody to, be, to take on the voice of activism or the voice of politics when that might not be their native voice. And I'm thinking of, um, for instance, you know, instances where it can backfire. So one example that I'll offer up that might be familiar to a, a lot of folks in the room is uh, Maddie Healy is very politically outspoken, right? He is on kind of the left of the political spectrum. Uh, he, he makes uh, political statements during his performances and things like that. But he does so often in, at the very best, in kind of a ham-fisted way, but sometimes in ways that uh, does active harm. He was uh, trying to critique Kanye West and Donald Trump, and he ended up giving a Nazi salute on, on stage. And that gesture did active harm to Jewish people, especially in the context of rising anti-Semitism. So I feel like sometimes uh, we expect these celebrities to act as politicians, but the, we, we, the result that comes out might be very different from what we want or expect. There might be some kind of unintended consequence to this kind of ratcheting up of this notion that celebrities need to always uh, be so politically vocal. So staying on the topic of Maddie Healy, so Swift has faced some criticism for her actions, such as her relationship with Healy or something like her carbon emissions. Um, some of this criticism has even came, come from her own fans. So what do you think this says about her fan base, that they're willing to criticize her in this way? I, I honestly think it's a healthy thing. I, I think it shows that the Swifty fandom is not monolithic, that we have uh, conversations among ourselves about whether Taylor is uh, upholding the ethics that she uh, pr proposes, that she is, you know, walking the walk. And we have uh, disagreements within the, the Swifty fandom, and I think it shows that, you know, we're not, we don't always speak with one voice. I mean, we don't, we can't even agree on what is the better album, Folklore <laughs> or Evermore, right? So we do have this, you know, range of opinions about, um, uh, about all the things and, uh, and I think the, the criticism of her carbon admissions, her private jet use, and some of you know, the choices that she made over the summer, I feel, like, uh, I feel like those are legitimate. On the carbon admission question, I'll just say, uh, for those criticizing Taylor's carbon admissions, I hope they go after Steven Spielberg and Jay-Z with the same energy, because they are right up there in terms of their carbon admissions and private jet use. And if those folks are not coming at those celebrities and critiquing them, you know, I, I, I'm curious as to why. 
And it might have something to do with gender. I'll just throw <laughs> that out. Yeah, I definitely think it shows that Taylor Swift fans are not as fragile as some might think we are, that we, our love for Taylor Swift can persist even with the nuance of understanding that there may be choices that she makes that maybe don't align with our, what we believe morally or maybe even what standards we think that she should have for herself, um, but that we feel, I guess I would say, safe enough to express those concerns and still feel comfortable supporting Taylor Swift knowing that she does hear feedback, she does, uh, she is consistently striving to to live up to those morals. And so the fact that, you know, the, the, the we're comfortable expressing that criticism and still supporting her shows, I think, the flexibility and the commitment of, of those fans. And, and just to add to that, I think, uh, you know, Hannah made, Hannah made a great point that she does listen to us, you know, she does listen to the fandom and responds. And one example of that would be the anti-hero video had a, a moment in it that many saw as fat phobic and she re-edited the video to take that scene out. So I think she is, she's watching us. You yeah. Know, yeah. And she broke up with Maddie Healy, so. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's because of us, but she, I think, knew she didn't have our support. Yeah, so as one of the most famous people in the world, she receives a ton of media coverage. So how can Taylor Swift be used as sort of a case study to look at how women are portrayed in the media? I think she's, you look at Taylor Swift and you see how women are treated. You look at how Taylor Swift is treated, you see how women are treated. Because um, I think often when you hear the way people talk about Taylor Swift, she can be substituted for women as a whole. What is expected of women, what is okay for women to achieve, uh, but how, where they should stay um, safe and where they shouldn't go too far or become too successful or you know, date too many men or not want to settle down or things like that that I think any time someone's talking about Taylor Swift, it's a direct analogy for how they talk about or treat women. And I think uh, the way that Taylor Swift is treated shows this double bind that a, a lot of women face and that if they uh, speak from their heart, if they are, um, uh, you know, and, and, and Taylor's known for her kind of autobiographical, personalistic songwriting, and so folks that kind of express themselves are criticized for being too personalistic, for you know, maybe centering themselves too much. But when she is speaking with more polish, then she's criticized for being you know, calculating and overly strategic. And so I think I, some of the treatment of Taylor, I, I think you, you said it really well, that it is sort of uh, illustrates in microcosm these larger divisions uh, that we have in our society based around gender. So I'll direct this one at Hannah first. So last fall, many millions of fans um, went to purchase tickets to the Eras Tour and were met with hardship, um, whether that be high ticket prices or fees. Um, so how, how did this help spark conversations about monopolies and economic equality? Yeah, so um, the survey that I conducted among Taylor Swift fans who tried to get tickets, it was amazing to me how many of them of their own volition in um, the open-ended questions brought up Ticketmaster as a monopoly. and spoke directly that capitalism is is to play is is to blame here it's not taylor swift it is capitalism and that it is uh, the fact that ticketmaster is a monopoly and it started a conversation that i didn't realize so many people were so passionate about and i think the that it led to the senate hearing surrounding ticketmaster as a monopoly it became much more commonplace to understand what a monopoly is what the what the consequences of that are for consumers and the broader um, how that fits in broad into what capitalism looks like today. And so I never thought, you know, you'd look at Taylor Swift and have, be like, oh, yes, she's sparking our conversation about around the economic system that we live in today. But um, if anyone could do it, I, I think she has because people have experienced firsthand what it looks like to experience a monopoly. And I think it speaks to the power of Swifties insofar as other artists have tried to push back against Ticketmaster, uh, most notably probably Pearl Jam, but I don't remember the Pearl Jammers or whatever their fans are called. I don't remember them <laughs> mounting such an effective uh, pushback against, uh, against Ticketmaster and the, the monopoly they have. And I also think it illustrates how she, that she has quite a bit of power, but she, at the end of the day, is often beholden to these larger-than-life corporations like Spotify, like Apple Music, like Ticketmaster, and that, and she has over her career pushed back against the power that these economic entities have. 
but only to a point. She took her catalog off Spotify for years, but ultimately put it back on. She fought with Ticketmaster for uh, fair royalties for artists, but ultimately, you know, she is on Apple Music. And so there's, I think, we like to talk about how much power Taylor has and how much power the Swifties have, and I think that's true, but there is a, a kind of upper limit to that in a, a, a capitalist context that, that we're in. I think also that um, the fact that Taylor Swift throughout her career has, has made a point of standing up for, for artists and for musicians to, to have their own, you know, with her fighting for her masters to um, having, talking to, negotiating with Spotify so that artists make more profit on their own songs. I think that kind of, that ethos around her as an artist has trickled down to Swifties as a fandom that our first response as a fandom when experiencing this with Ticketmaster was to, to address of like, what can we do to change this? How can we fight back against Ticketmaster? And I think that shows that that is something that I think we got from Taylor Swift of like, okay, there's these systems that are not fair to us and that we don't think serve us. How can we make change within those spheres? So the Federal Reserve has said that Taylor Swift's Eras Tour this summer boosted the U.S. economy. So what is it about Taylor and the Eras Tour that has created such a strong economic impact? I think there's some rebound from COVID, honestly, and, and we're in a, a new era of COVID. I think there are people out there hungry for uh, experiences and uh, hungry to be around other people. And I think the success of the Eras Tour speaks to that. Also, she had uh, three albums, and then with the release of Midnight, so four albums you know, that uh, she had released where she hadn't toured because, the, because Loverfest was canceled. And so there was this incredible uh, pent-up uh, energy and demand from Swifties who were hungry for the Eras tour. I read something just yesterday that the uh, boost to the economy in terms of consumer spending over the summer, it was estimated that it was going to be about $50 billion just from the Eras tour. And uh, a more recent estimate puts that at more of closer to $100 billion. So somewhere between 50 and $100 billion in consumer spending from the Eras tour. It's quite, it's quite remarkable. And I think that the, the passion and just like wholeheartedness that goes into being a Swifty carries over into the ec economic impact too because you can just buy a ticket and then of course there's the economic impact of you know parking or staying in a hotel or whatever but no one wanted to just buy a ticket and go right you bought your string for your friendship bracelets and then all the beads like I saw that just like beads everywhere was like there was a bead shortage because everyone was just like wanted to to go all out and to be part of it that you have to buy your t-shirts you buy your costumes you buy the hats you buy everything and so you know, I think it goes along with just the passion and the verve that, that Swifties have, that it's not just doing something, it's doing it and being extra, and I think Taylor would definitely support that. Yeah. It, it makes me think, though, and I don't have a good answer to this, so, so I'll just throw it out there. It, is it possible, uh, it is, what is the link between fandom and consumerism? That is, is it possible to be a fan and do fanish things without being a consumer? Or is fandom inevitably tied to consumerism? I don't know. And I'm kind of a hypocrite bringing that up because I have, uh, I have three Karma is a Cat t-shirts. You know, I have plenty of merch, so I'm not really walking the walk there. But I, I think it's interesting to think about the link between our consumeristic practices and fandom. Are they, uh, are they inevitably, is, is one inevitably connected to the other? So Taylor Swift recently said on Instagram about her fans, quote, I've heard you raise your voices and I know how powerful they are. Um, so it seems like a lot of Taylor Swift's power comes not only from her, but from how dedicated and spirited her fan base is. So to what extent do you think that the Swifties should be credited for Taylor Swift's influence? I think if you were to ask Taylor, she would give us probably a lot more credit than we would give ourselves maybe. Um, but I do think that the community surrounding Taylor Swift is just as much of a, of a phenomenon as Taylor Swift herself. And I think Taylor Swift definitely has credit in creating this strong community. The fact that she is so involved in our community, that she tailorks, right? And she has the secret sessions, that she responds to 
her fans, that during the pandemic she was Venmoing fans money so that they could pay for rent. The fact that she has helped cultivate this community, that is credit to her as well. But I definitely think that there is stuff that we, has done, we have done on our own. For example, like the friendship bracelets, that wasn't mm -hmm. Taylor Swift's idea, that was a fan's idea. And she shared it in a few places and it went viral and it became synonymous with Taylor Swift and Taylor embraced it herself. And so I definitely think it is a cooperative thing. Um, but if Taylor didn't cultivate that, if she didn't put in the legwork from day one of supporting her fans, of showing her dedication to her fans, of um, looking out for us and giving us fun things to do and great art to consume, uh, we wouldn't have something to rally behind. So I think it's definitely, she is the the, the culprit and the, the causation, um, but uh, we definitely are where a lot of her is where a lot of her power comes from. I, I agree with that 100%. And that she has laid the, the foundation from the very beginning. She was giving the fans clues to decode, and that's been a tradition that's carried through her career. And she's kept the energy level high in that regard. But the Swifties have met her halfway, and the yeah the the idea of the friendship bracelet as something that has grown up organically because of a single line in a single song, or the let's go chant at the beginning of Delicate. There are a lot of fan-specific practices that the Swifties have developed. And I've been involved in uh, other music scenes and subcultures, and I've been involved in other fandoms before, but there is something really genuinely warm about the Swifties. There's something, there's kind of an ethos of kindness that kind of, uh, that, it, that weaves its way through the fandom. And I don't mean to say that there aren't toxic elements or uh, that there, there are you know, bad actors in the Swifty fandom. Of course there are, it's a huge, it's a huge group. Uh, but there is something I think truly unique about, about the, the energy and kindness of this fan, fan base. Mm -hmm. So like Brian said earlier, a large portion of Taylor Swift fans are younger people, millennials. Um, so what do you think this vast influence of the Swifties says about the power of young people? I think that if you can get young people invested and young people on board, it's showing that we are, young people are willing to act as a community and that they still are community minded and they're not as hyper individualistic as it might seem. Um, that they just need to feel seen, heard, and have buy in to a community, and then that community can work wonders. Mm -hmm. and, and your comment about the kind of cross generational influence and nature of the Taylor Swift fandom I think is relevant here too in that she has managed to energize and connect with people of all ages. Uh, but I think the way that she speaks to, uh, to young people is, is truly unique. And the people of her generation uh, feel like they've grown up with her, that, that they are reading her diary and she is reading their diary. The, the people of my generation who are fans of Taylor Swift see her music as kind of like a time machine that can bring them back to an, an earlier part of their lives. And then I think the, the young fan base, you know, there's something, uh, there's something special about, uh, about that connection as, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So recently a former Trump White House aide said on The View that the only person that can beat Donald Trump in 2024 is Taylor Swift. Um, whether or not we agree with that, what do you think this says about the, what do you think the rise of Trump and Swift's influence shows about the intersection of celebrities and politics? Mm. Take it away, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so, uh, before I invested a lot of research into Taylor Swift, I looked at parasocial relationships and I think, one of the strongest rise of parasocial relationships we've seen in the past few years is the parasocial relationships that people experience with Donald Trump, right? Of seeing him as a, po a politician, yes, but before him, there's really not that much of a phenomenon of politicians as parasocial actors. That people didn't see politicians so much as people they, they saw as a friend. Um, but we do see that with, with Trump, right? As some uh, people who feel like he is speaking for them, he gets them, he sees them, they know him, they understand him in a way that we've seen with celebrities that we haven't seen with politicians. So I think it's, it speaks more as to what Trump has done to change politicians into celebrities than Taylor Swift as a political actor in a way. Because um, the same way that Trump's supporters seem to be fans of his mirror what would actually make more sense in a situation like 
like a singer or someone like Taylor Swift, where he is then kind of crossing into our realm. And then you see Taylor Swift a little bit now crossing into that realm as well. But I think that's something that's a little bit more precedented than the way that Trump's celebrity has kind of defined him. Wow, yeah, that's, that's a really smart observation. I would, I would add that in, in some ways, Taylor at this point seems beyond politics in the sense. And I remember when she came out against uh, Marsha Blackburn and uh, Trump said that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, like, I like her 25% less, or I like her music 25% less. He didn't say, I hate her now, right? That's, th I think that's telling. And I think that she has avoided being caught up in kind of culture war discourse in a way like that maybe a corporation like Target or Bud Light uh, hasn't. I think her, her stardom is burning so bright now, she's almost untouchable. A week ago, the Federalist ran a piece that said that fandom of Taylor is a sign of societal decay. But really, honestly, that's the only uh, uh, kind of uh, current hit piece that I've seen against her, it, putting her in, into this kind of, cult, uh, 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 th this kind of uh, culture war discourse. And so I think in some ways she is, uh, her, her stardom puts her beyond some of the political context that we might place other folks that, that uh, dabble in politics. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest headlines surrounding Swift right now is her relationship with Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey, which is close to home for a lot of us. So we're seeing the Swifties and the NFL fans kind of merge, and these are two very large fandoms, um, but two very different demographics. So what have you guys been seeing from um, this clash in culture, sort of? I think it's interesting how willing and open Swifties are to embracing the NFL culture and how unwilling the NFL culture is <laughs> to embrace Swifties. And I'm, there's a lot you could say about gender there too, I'm sure, there, that is a dynamic. But I think it also just shows Swifties' openness and interest that they have in Taylor Swift's lives. Like, we like him, you like him, we like him. You know, we're on board. I'm within reason, because that did not happen for Maddie Healy. But, um, but I just, the way that you see now this, the, the Travis Kelsey jersey sales going up by 400% and the NFL tickets going up in price. I, I'm going to admit, I tried to get a ticket to the Chiefs game this Thursday. I didn't end up doing it because the price, it went up so much. But that people are willing like, to, to embrace the things that she shows interest in and just the passion that Swifties bring to everything. But I do think the reverse is super interesting as well, that it's seeing that Swift, you know, Taylor Swift is ruining the NFL and that she's going to distract Travis Kelsey, she's going to ruin his season. She's you know, this destructive force in the NFL, when really she is bringing the NFL so much, you know, not that they didn't have publicity before, but a completely new audience that was not invested before is now there. And so and then you, the idea that she's bringing down the NFL in any way is just laughable. Um, but I think the attitude from Taylor Swift fan and towards Taylor Swift fan is just, you know, it's what Taylor Swift fans probably expected going in, that that was what their reception would be. Um, but I think it's, again, just like a microcosm of, of the Taylor Swift fans outlooks, uh, outlook on society and society's outlook towards them. Mm -hmm. I think a turning point was when one of the NFL commentators made a blank space reference in one of the, in, in the color commentary. And so I, I do think that there is a sense that she is seeping into NFL culture a little bit, but there are definitely a large contingent of people who uh, see her as a distraction or, or a problem. I am bracing myself. Uh, currently, I love it. It, it is the, the two most energetic fandoms kind of combining forces. It's a big win for the Kansas City era, uh, area. But I am, I'm worried uh, about if the Chiefs lose, will Taylor be blamed? And I think that's almost inevitable. Yeah, because it's been so far so good as they've been winning. Right. It's like, oh, she's, you know, she's bringing such a fun energy. But yeah, you're right. The moment they lose, it's like, brace yourselves. Right. Yeah. So as we start to wrap up, what do you think politicians or leaders can learn from Taylor Swift and her influence? Um, I, I think uh, you know there's a few lessons they can take away. I remember the speech that she gave, uh, not this last summer, but the summer before, when she was being awarded a degree from uh, an honorary degree from NYU, and she gave a wonderful commencement address. And you should all take a look at it if you haven't. 
And she said that we need to, uh, to learn to live alongside cringe, because what is, quote, cringe now might be cool later, what is cool now might, might be cringe later. And I think that's a great lesson, not just for like leaders and politicians, but for, um, but for everyone. Also, I think the lesson that she has in the outro of her song Daylight in the 2019 album Lover, where she says, you know, I want to be defined by the things that I love, not the things that I hate, not the things that keep me up at night. I think uh, more politicians and leaders should be defined by the things that they love and not the things that they hate, that, that, what you, that they should uh, be oriented by the positive instead of the, the negative. I think politicians should start leaving Easter eggs in their speeches. I think that would really improve things. Um, I also think um, in terms of what Swift has done herself, I think um, using vulnerability as an asset, I think something that draws people to Taylor Swift so much is her willingness to be vulnerable through her music because that is what people feel like they connect to, they understand about her, and makes them feel seen by her. So I think if politicians were willing to employ vulnerability more and, and show more about what truly matters to them and more per, uh, of them personally, I feel like that is going to be what helps people connect to them more and be more willing to support them and have to invest more in them because it feels like the investment is more mutual. So I have one more question before we turn it over to the audience. So just a reminder to be thinking of these questions that you have if you're part of our virtual audience. Um, you can email dullquestions at ku.edu with any questions you might have. So what do you say to people who don't understand the importance of studying a subject like Taylor Swift? I would say just looking at the critical acclaim of Taylor Swift, that she has won 40 American Music Awards. She has won uh, 12 Grammy Awards, including three for Album of the Year, which puts her in the company of Stevie Wonder, Frank Sinatra, and Paul Simon. She is the greatest songwriter of the 21st century, and she absolutely needs to be spoken of with the same reverence as we speak of Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, and Paul McCartney. And that might be a hard thing for people my generation and older to hear, but it is true. I think the public perception of Taylor Swift is often shaped by the radio-friendly pop songs that people are familiar with, but if you dig in, just even slightly into her, her catalog, you will see one of the, the most important songwriters and storytellers of the, the last generation. I think so often people disregard things as part of popular culture as being trivial um, because they aren't seen as being as, as high art as other things that should be taken seriously. And I think that is only exacerbated when the artist is a woman, particularly a young woman, um, especially because she got her start so young that it's uh, maybe instinct or um, for um, society to kind of brush her off and, and, and disregard her as unimportant. But I think, like Brian mentioned, just the, the proof is in the pudding of the impact that she has on millions of people's lives every day and understanding how that impact uh, occurs, the, the outcome of those impacts and, and what that means for the future, I think um, is something worth understanding because it's, it's playing a massive role in millions of people's lives every day. Mm -hmm. So now we'll turn it over to the audience for questions. Um, we have two students with microphones ready to come around to you, so just raise your hands and one of them will come to you. We have one up here in the front. how the friendship bracelets got started. So in my day going to a concert, we just went to a concert once and that was it, right? So now Swifties are traveling from town to town to town and wanna to go to multiple concerts. So how did that get started? Uh, I think it's just, I think a big part of it is the surprise songs, right? So every concert on the Eras tour, she sings two songs as part of an acoustic set and they're different songs every single time. And so uh, part of it is that you want to experience as many of the songs as possible. And she did different outfits 
um, for different uh, different shows. And so it's almost like you want to know, oh, which which dress did you get during Cardigan? Oh, which uh, which secret songs or which surprise songs did you get? And so you want to experience that more than once. And you know, I was lucky enough to be able to go twice in both Kansas City and Denver. And part of it was that the hype around it was so intense that you almost were in a daze, right, when you saw the concert. And so the idea that you want to have it a second time to make sure that you really get everything out of it, especially a show that's three hours long, right, that it's really worth the investment to travel and to go see it because it's not just like she's going out and doing a 40-minute set. She's doing a three-hour long set every time. So I think it's like anything Taylor Swift does. She comes at it from so many angles to really make it worthwhile for fans, um, to really make it an experience that is worth investing in. Yeah, I, I think the surprise songs is, is a big element of that. Also, and this sounds kind of paradoxical, but the live streams from TikTok, the obsessive Swifties would watch those every weekend. And instead of watching the live streams and thinking, oh, OK, I've experienced the concert, it actually ramped up the desire to see the concert. And because they were watching multiple live streams, it, it kind of demonstrated that you get that strong serotonin hit every time you attend. And so I think that also uh, helped. Uh, it prompted people to, to see her more than once. And I think it also explains why the, the concert movie, which is coming out in a week, uh, has sold out so quickly and why people were you know, buying tickets for multiple nights. One right there. Uh, Dr. Donovan, you mentioned how um, people in older generations maybe have this sort of hesitancy or hold out to accept Swift as one of the truly greats in American music. And while I do think gender is a, is a big factor in that, do you think there's anything else that plays into this sort of you know, protective nature of superstardom? That's a great question. I think, yeah, I do think gender has a, a, plays a big role. Uh, and I think uh, Swift distinguishes between her glitter gel pen songs, the fountain pen songs, and the quill pen songs. So her, her more pop-oriented songs uh, versus her deeper songs and then the, the fountain pen songs being uh, a more of a middle ground. And I think a lot of people are more familiar with those glitter gel pen songs and aren't aware of the quill pen songs. I also think it's, it, there's a generational aspect in that my generation, which is uh, Gen X, put a lot of emphasis on being cool and being kind of detached and being kind of above it all as a stance that was valued and esteemed. And I think Hannah's comment about uh, how Taylor's uh, vulnerability is a real selling point, uh, I think to an older generation that um, uh, I, I, don't th I don't think that vulnerability is seen as the strength that it is by some in an older generation. Right, do you have any? I, amen. <laughs> There's one back there. Okay, two questions. Did you get Timeless as a surprise song? I did. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, okay, my second question is you were talking about like hyper consumerism and stuff. Um, do you think like Taylor herself kind of supports that by like releasing like four versions of 1989 vinyls and like a million merch collections and all these cardigans and like all that kind of stuff? Like, do you think like she kind of supports that like hyper consumerism and like capitalism in that sense? Yeah, I mean, we can be <laughs> honest about that. Yeah, I mean, she is a, she's a, a genius songwriter, but she's also a genius at marketing. What struck me was when there was the rollout of Midnight's, there, was, there, there were the four album variants that make the clock, right? But also on the merch store, she was selling cassette tapes, which to me makes no sense. I don't know who owns a cassette player, but she... But people were buying them. So I do, yeah, I, I admit that she is, um, it's, it's her, she's the problem, it's her. Yeah. She, is our, she is our capitalist queen. Like, as the Phantom says, like, she is the only exception. Like, she is a capitalist queen. And there's one back there that's been raising their hand. Well, 
Well, I know you're a Gen X. I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> and I don't know... <laughs> I don't know the granular level as much as all of you are, but I do know that Taylor Swift is probably the one of the most influential performers in my lifetime, even compared to the Bob Dylans and others. But you know, the, the title of your, your talk tonight is about influence and advocacy. And so I'd like to hear you comment on what's the difference relative to their impact, meaning influencers, maybe, maybe being an influencer happens and people pick what they want. Advocacy is really more intentional. Like when she told people to her age, please um, you know, sign up to vote. That is advocacy. That is a focused, narrow, I want you to go to the polls, I want you to vote. <laughs> But what I hear you all talking to, about tonight is the level of influence she has had on our society. And I see her as a major influencer that is going to change a lot of the paths that people choose. So I'd like to hear you comment on influence and advocacy. I, I think she's advocated for a, a number of, of causes. She supported uh, making a Juneteenth a national holiday. She supported the NAACP Legal and Educational Fund. She donated uh, $113,000 to LGBTQ advocacy groups. And I think, I think she has put her money and her, her influence into uh, the, the, the political uh, causes that, that she cares about. And I know that a lot of us feel like she should say more and should do more, but I, I feel like she does, she does a lot more than we realize. She made major donations to food banks at every tour stop, and she makes donations to humane societies. And we only know that she makes those donations because those food banks and humane societies uh, tell us. It's, it's nothing that she you know, brags about. Uh, I also think that there are uh, political elements in her songwriting, that, uh, and that's something that we, ha we didn't have a chance to talk about, but I feel like she does these overt political acts, but there are a, a very politicized and uh, uh, I think highly uh, influential aspects of her songwriting that, uh, th that is a, a realm of politics, not in terms of like voting or lobbying, but, but politics of a different form. I think she does rely a lot on her influence and maybe less so on her overt advocacy, um, in that again the the messages in her songs um, and you know supporting women, supporting LGBTQ plus folks, um, and I think she is finding her voice as an advocate. Um, as you know, if you watch her documentary Miss Americana, she talks about how her whole life she has kind of been discouraged from being an advocate, and I think it's taking her some time to. She wants to feel very confident in what she's advocating for before she, before she does that. And I think, um, I think as time progresses, we'll see her be more comfortable in her role as an advocate. And we have already in the past few years seen her growing more comfortable in her role as an advocate. And it'll be interesting to see how that develops in the future. But I think it hasn't been as strong as her influence. And I think she has relied on, on assuming that people know what she stands for because she walks the walk a little bit more. Um, but I, I think that she has a lot of potential in her role as an advocate, and I look forward to seeing how she grows into that in the future. As another boomer, <laughs> yes, we are here, uh, <laughs> who remembers the Stones and the Beatles and Elvis, um, it occurs to me that her not being quite so vehement in her advocacy might come from her watching other famous people in the entertainment industry be burnt mm -hmm. by coming out too strong. And I'm, I'm thinking of John Lennon. But I also remember how Elvis let his music speak for his advocacy. Uh, and also, yes, the Beatles did and, and the Stones, but I, I really think of Elvis with his country music background toward the end of his performing life. Let his advocacy speak 
for him through what he sang. And I think that that's what she's doing in part. But I also was glad to hear you talk about what she gave to food banks. That is huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think she has studied the recording artists and the celebrities that have come before her and ha has learned from their mistakes. We could say maybe that has made her overly cautious in some respects, but I, I feel like she is, uh, she, she's very savvy in that regard to learn from those that have come before her. Next question, we have one over here. Okay, we can go over here and then back there by Abby if there's one. We'll get you after that. Hi, um, so we're coming up on uh, like about 20 years of Swift and Swifties, and at least the perception is that our fans are younger women. How do you think that broad gender roles and gender dynamics changes over the last 20 years have changed Swift's influence? I think one thing that has changed as well is just Taylor Swift has grown up, right? At the beginning of her music, she was 15. And so she was writing about fairy tales and she was writing about um, things like that. And we've seen her music mature and her, her perspective on gender roles, on relationship expectations, dynamics. You look at some of the, the songs from her earlier discography and you're like, those are toxic relationships, Taylor. Like, those are not things you should be you know, supporting, but it's because she was 17 at the time. And now her perspective as a 30 year old is very different. And I think, so even just her growing up and learning and understanding what feminism is, right? There's that interview that she did when she was younger where she said she wouldn't consider herself a feminist because she thinks women and women should be equal. And it's like, oh, that, you know, she, un then later she has said, you know, that, that she is a feminist. And so I think part of it is that times have changed. And I think part of it is that she has grown up and she has come into her own as understanding the world around her, understanding the role that she plays, um, you know, as some as in the music industry, the sexism she's experienced, being able to put labels on that, understand what's hap like what her experience has been, and so I think that that has happened as her fans have grown up too, and so I think that now she's in a place where um, she has an understanding of of the role that she plays in society regarding how uh, women are treated and how women are seen, and she's embraced that a lot more because she understands it a lot more as she's gotten older. I, I think that her kind of evolution in terms of her f feminist vision is is really significant. That uh, she didn't identify as a feminist earlier in her career, or spoke about feminism in this kind of rudimentary men versus women kind of framework. Uh, I, and I feel that her development as uh, having a uh, political consciousness and uh, having more of uh, a grounding in uh, a feminist vision came along right also right at the Me Too movement. And I think her the sexual assault trial, uh, the DJ David Mueller who uh, assaulted her and then she complained and then he was fired and then he sued her uh, and then she countersued for a dollar and, and won that suit. I think that was a significant moment. Uh, I also think that uh, she, her support for, and this is not talked about as much as it should be talked about, her support for Kesha when uh, the, pop, the pop singer Kesha was in a legal dispute with a producer named Dr. Luke, who she accused of sexual assault and harassment. Taylor gave a quarter million dollars to Kesha's legal fund. And I think that the, the Me Too movement is, T Taylor's not listed as one of the, um, uh, the kind of movers in that movement, but I, I feel like uh, she, she should be mentioned in, in that context as well. Um, if we have a question in the back, okay. okay. Uh, thank you for coming and for this uh, great presentation. Uh, talk about influence I brought. My wife told me we should go to this, and she went to school here, and it's the first time she's been here at the Dole Institute, so it's very good that you're here. Uh, my question is about the 2015-2018 campaign uh, for, uh, well, then-candidate Trump and presidential candidate Trump. 
Uh, my question is, do you think, given that she spoke out in 2018, after what we saw, what the world saw riding down the escalator uh, in 2015, uh, singers like Bruce Springsteen, uh, Adele, uh, you know, those prominent singers, do you think history will look kind on those who stay silent during this, during that period? Because look where we're at right now uh, in terms of, you know, January 6th and other major events in our democracy. Do you think history will look kind upon those who stayed silent during that time period where it was crucial? I, I hope she's more outspoken in this upcoming electoral cycle. If we look back at 2016, if you look at the timeline of the, the controversy with her, Kim Kardashian, and Kanye West, she was facing a major mental health crisis in that this phone call that she had with Kanye West was revealed to the public, and we now know that it was an edited phone call, but it, it made the uh, large swaths of social media turn on her and the entertainment press turn on, on her precisely at the moment when it would have been uh, helpful if she was more vocal. But I completely understand why she didn't uh, tiptoe in to the, the 2016 political conversation. And honestly, uh, given the barrage of hate that she was receiving and kind of the, the negative framing of Taylor Swift at that time, I, her advocacy for uh, democratic politicians might, it might not have played out the way that we think it, it did play out. But I, I understand, the, I appreciate the comment, and I, I do hope that she is more vocal in, in this uh, upcoming cycle. But um, I also think she, in some sense, doesn't owe us anything in the sense that um, we can hope that she is more of an advocate, but uh, she ultimately, uh, she, she's surrounded by smart people and will do, I think, she, she'll make the move that makes the most sense for, um, for, for her and, and, and for the, the nation. Yeah, I think, in a way, I think she does regret, in a way, that she yes. wasn't more vocal, mm -hmm. um, and I think that for that reason, we can count on her being a little more vocal this next time around. And like Brian mentioned, there were so many contextual factors of, of why she might not have spoken up. Uh, I would love to see the alternate universe where she did uh, advocate and see if that would have made a difference if people, again, take, took her seriously at that time in her career. It's easy to see the, the influence she has now and forget that that was not the same scope of influence that she had in 2016. Um, she was not. She was very famous, but not to the extent that she is today, and not as well beloved as she is today. Mm -hmm. She had a lot more hate at that time, and a lot less support. And she's talked about how she perceived it that no one wanted to hear from her, and that no one did trust her or believe her. So I think she misunderstood the level of advocacy she had at that time, and that is what um, led her not to speak out. But I think now that she has a better perspective of the impact she could have, I am hopeful as well that she will will speak up a little bit more this time around. We have one right there. Um, I grew up mostly on Elvis because of my grandma. My, my grandma, she, she passed away in 2022 of November and she was really close with Elvis and I just, I just feel like Taylor Swift has given like her all of her talent to get to where she is right now, and like, like, like she has a gift that came from the Lord up above, and she used that talent to get to where she is right now, and and I and I I hope she does well with the rest of her career, and I hope she has a good rest of her week. Absolutely. I love that she's being spoken of in the same breath as Elvis. I think that's absolutely appropriate. Yeah. Thanks and for I, sharing that. And I definitely think that her talent has gotten her where she is today and I'm and that that sometimes is overlooked uh, of you know she has her business savvy but she also just is such a talented songwriter and that is what a lot of it comes down to is she's just good at what she does. One right here, and then we can go back there as well after. Uh, 
Or I guess we can go back there first. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Has there been any research done on uh, which individual era has been the most impactful, whether it be on her career or on society, in terms of like its its messages and the time it was released? The, there is a scholar named uh, Simone Driesen who has studied Taylor Swift fans and their reaction to her 2018 political turn. Uh, and I think one could make a case, and this might be because also Lover is my favorite album, but I think the Lover era might be regarded as maybe the most impactful in terms of politics. It's on that album and in that era that we find her most overt political songs like uh, like You Need to Calm Down, The Man, uh, Miss Americana, and The Heartbreak Prince, but um, you might have a different take as a, a, a rep. Uh, well, I was going to say, you know, you, the, she first started selling out stadiums at Reputation, and so that, I think, is, is a turn uh, as well. But it's hard to say, because <laughs> I, I haven't seen any uh, re research looking specifically comparing the eras um, although it'd be hard to not, you know, they just build on each other so much that it just feels like this most recent era is when she really, the, the era's era is <laughs> when the most has been happening. Um, and so it seems like it's all just kind of been building to this moment. So was she comparing it to other artists? Other eras. So Taylor Swift, each of her album is considered an era of her life. Um, and so fans like to sometimes compare these eras to each other, which one's the best, which one has the best music, which one has the best style, things like that. Um, and different kind of messages come out from each of these eras. So Taylor Swift has all these different entities even within herself. And, and just to add to that, it's she has uh, reimagined herself in these different eras with a new aesthetic, often a new sound, often a completely new music genre. And I don't think uh, male artists have that expectation that they will have to kind of reinvent themselves every album they release, but that's something that, that Taylor has done successfully. Um, so at the beginning of Taylor's career um, until like 1989, a lot of um, people <laughs> like hated on her and her fans, and then with 1989, um, society started to appreciate her a lot more, and then with the Kim and Kanye situation, the society started to dislike her. Um, and then we saw when around like folklore, people started to like her more, then like Red Taylor's version, people started to like her more, and then uh, Midnight's as well um, had a big boost. And so now it feels like we're like back in this era of society um, being on the side of Taylor Swift. And um, as a Swifty myself, and I think a lot of other Swifties probably share this fear of possibly having another big thing like the Kim and Kanye phone call mm -hmm. happen where society decides to turn on Taylor Swift again. Um, and I wanted to know your opinion on if we are doomed to another Taylor Swift apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think true fans stood by her through that era, right, that time when society turned on her. And I think she now has a new level of, of loyal fans. Um, whereas before she had a certain level of loyal fans, a certain amount of casual fans. But I think that amount of loyal fans has increased to a point where I wonder if it will reach a critical mass of people still willing to stand up for her. I also think there is more conversation around the intense scrutiny that Taylor faces that equivalent male artists wouldn't face. And I think that there is more understanding that, you know, had the Kim and Kanye controversy happened to a male artist, she would not have been turned against in such a strong way. And I wonder if we have a, as a society understand that a little bit more now that it's like our, the criticism of her is uh, not proportionate to the actions that she has been taking. And so I hope that we've made enough progress in the past five years that even so it might happen, but not catastrophically to the same extent as it did before. And I think also Taylor has a, a stronger sense of self now than she did then, that something happening like that wouldn't have the same effect on her personally that that, that canceling of her happened at that time had on her.
Right. It, it does feel like the 1989 era again, in a sense that there is this surge of popularity and she has a, a new uh, set of, of fans. And, it, and I, I do share that same concern that there might be some public turn against her and that she might you know, uh, uh, disappear like she did after, uh, after the, uh, the controversy with uh, Kim and Kanye. Uh, one thing that has come up in my research on Swifties, uh, when I've interviewed the OG Swifties, the Swifties who have been fans since 2006, they talk about how uh, for, for many years being a Taylor Swift fan was not, it was not considered cool. Uh, there was this kind of stigma about it, that there was this kind of label of basic that was applied to them. And, and so I've asked them, you know, do, you know, when she became uh, more popular in the 1989 era, and then yet more popular in the folklore era, and now, you know, do you, you know, how do, how do you feel about that? And a lot of them have said uh, that it's, it's like more the merrier. Yes, that's great that these new fans are coming into the fold, uh, but also, you know, where have you been? We've been telling you what a great songwriter uh, she is for, for years and years, and so, why, you know, why now? So I think, I think it is a, a genuine, concern, and these things do tend to have a, a cycle to them, but I, I would hope that her stardom at this point and her security in her stardom would be enough to buffer any kind of uh, blowback or sense of overexposure that she might encounter. Probably have time for one or two more questions. There's one up here, and then three up here. All right, so both of you guys study Taylor Swift. Do you guys think that we will see this trend continue with other celebrities? I mean, obviously Taylor's kind of at the top of the game right now, it appears, but like you said earlier, Beyonce's very popular, very well-known, very beloved, just like Taylor. Do you think there'll become a point where we're starting to study other celebrities? I, I hope so. I, I don't think we should just study Taylor or just focus on Taylor. And I've noticed that some of the, the practices that Taylor has innovated, like uh, the leaving of the Easter eggs, for instance, like other artists are starting to do that, like Olivia Rodrigo has started to do that. And I, I think uh, one interesting conversation to be had is the extent to which there is some kind of isomorphic borrowing of you know, of, of different celebrity personas, the way that celebrities learn from one another and borrow what works and discard what doesn't work. But I absolutely think we should be uh, st studying other celebrities and we should be studying fandom in general because what looks like maybe a waste of time on the surface, you know, why are you spending so much time and money and mental energy on Taylor Swift? It's, it's actually very important, and it brings people a lot of joy, which I think is really important in, in this day and age. And I think a lot of up-and-coming celebrities are going to be influenced by Taylor Swift um, in a way that um, will be interesting to watch, to see the lasting impact she has on the very nature of celebrity and what pr common practice for celebrity is. Um, and definitely, I think, you know, as she gets older, she at some point is going to have to take things slower than she is now. I don't know when, because you think it would have happened by now, but it hasn't. Um, but at some point, she, you know, will, you know, metaphorically pass the torch. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the influence that she has, ha has had on up-and-coming musicians as well. Okay, we can get your question right here, and then we'll wrap up. So we've seen the vulnerability, and we've discussed it among the Eras tour. Um, recently, we've seen the rise of like mothers mothering jokes, and then the real, the, like the reliability that her audience has across multiple gen multiple generations. But more importantly, I wanted to focus on the younger side. Why do you think we're so vulnerable with Taylor as opposed to like other artists? Like we don't really discuss that as much, and I think it's really important to uh, to interact with the idea that like she. We, sh we see her as one of us, as opposed to just another celebrity. I think it all comes down through her songwriting, right? That there are so many intimate details of her life portrayed in her songs that we truly do feel like we know her. Um, that that sh we, are, we feel comfortable being vulnerable with her because she was vulnerable with us first. Um, and that she was always the more vulnerable of the two in any given situation because she bears her soul in the music that she creates. And I think it's that atmosphere of openness, of vulnerability, and of willingness to share that 
is the the common denominator that that all Swifties feel because they feel like they know her and she sees them. And I, I think that this is something that's come up in, in my re research with, with Swifties that more than a few of them have said it's as if she is reading my diary. You know, and I think her genius is her ability to reveal different aspects and different little kind of picturesque details of her life, like you know, the red scarf you know, that she's leaving at, you know, allegedly Jake Gyllenhaal's sister's house, you know, those little details uh, that are very personal to her, but the song itself speaks to these near universal experiences. And so we can connect with it, and also we feel like we're getting a glimpse into, into her life as well. Okay, well, thank you guys both so much. Okay, we'll have time for one more question. I first heard of Taylor Swift since I was 10 years old, and uh, I heard her songs from the, the museum, the third one, Lego Ninjago movie, DC Lego Super Pets. That's all. But wait. I want everybody talking about my favorite song by Taylor Swift, Superman. And is anybody going to see Taylor Swift's concert at the movies. I'm gonna go see it. Are you guys? Gonna Absolutely, go see it? yeah. I'm, I'm gonna see it three times. And you're right. Superman is a completely underrated Taylor Swift song. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you guys both so much again for joining us. This has been a great program. Thank you guys, everyone, for coming out. It's been great. So much. Thank you. <laughs>